Hello and welcome to our ARB webinar featuring the latest research from our two journals, Journal of International Business Studies, Journal of International Business Policy. Uh, we've been running this uh, webinar series now for two and a half years. And as most of you know, our mission is sort of discuss uh, published research and talk about the broader implications arising from this uh, research, both for practice, but also for uh, future research. Uh, today, I have the pleasure to uh, uh, host three young scholars for all of them. Uh, it's their first GIPS paper, although they all also have at least one very high profile other paper. So they, they these are young scholars that I think we should be paying attention to uh, as they uh, seem to be very productive and, and probably contribute to the conversations in, in the future. Um, we would like to engage in discussion uh, and we do that through the Q&A function. I presume most people are familiar with Zoom. There is a Q&A button below. Uh, please type in your questions there. Keith will be the moderator today. He will pick up questions from there and uh, present them to the uh, presenters. Um, and he may have some questions himself and integrate the discussion as well. Um, for audience, you can also uh, vote for questions to move them up, which means they, they get to Keith's attention in this way. Um, bef before we start, just a, a few more uh, things I want to share I already said that the speakers are uh, young scholars this time. We usually try to mix young and experienced scholars, but I think on the to topic of digital economies, it's very nice to have young voices. The papers are all available online in, a, in the online advanced function on the GIPS website. Uh, they will be published in the special issue on the digital economy, which shall come out sometime later this year. I haven't been given any date yet. Uh, there is also an introduction, which is somewhere in the process. It should be online shortly. Uh, those of you who have worked with GIPS, you know that GIPS translates the abstracts in multiple languages. And so there's always a little bit of a gap between acceptance and actually things being online in advance. Those of us who work with GIPS know that trade-off. Having multiple languages makes more time. I wish also to thank various people who make this happen. Of course, there are the Editors of the journal who keep the journals running, the ARB office, Digital Motion is uh, providing the technical backup, and Dana Minbayeva, who's now my co coordinator for this whole series. And Keith is getting nervous. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we have by now a nice resource on the uh, uh, YouTube as well as on the ARB website where you can check all the webinars that we've held in the past, which is a nice resource special for PhD students. And with that, without further ado, I hand over to Keith Brothers, whom you know. He's a uh, professor of strategy at King's College in London, uh, has worked on foreign entry uh, on in emerging em uh, economies for a long time and recently <laughs> turned his attention to the digital economy. Okay, from London, Canada to London, UK. Keith, over to you. Thank you, Klaus. Yeah, a long time here. So, so as Klaus pointed out, today's selection of papers comes from a special issue that hopefully will be coming out later this year on international business in the digital age. Uh, and of course, the digital economy presents really exciting challenges for IB scholars. Digital technologies are changing the way international business is conducted. Uh, internally, within multinational uh, enterprises, digital technologies enable the disintermediation of processes, enabling uh, these firms to become faster, cheaper, and more responsive to changing needs. Externally, changes in government laws and regulations, a renewed focus on social concerns and changes in buying behaviors, uh, as exemplified in, during COVID-19, of course, that creates new opportunities to deliver digital technology-based solutions for production, purchasing, 
communications, marketing, and logistics across national borders. So businesses are thus developing digital strategies to create new business models and shifting costs and activities from their own firm to complementers, to customers, and to other stakeholders at home and abroad. So digitalization is changing businesses, not only in technically, technologically advanced nations, but also in emerging economies. And this provides these emerging economy firms with opportunities to catch up on business creation and expansion. So despite inequalities in the access to technologies, even in developing countries, digital technologies enable firms to disrupt sales and distribution systems, change consumer buying behavior, and alter demand for products and services. Firms may benefit from digitalization through, for example, greater access to resources, increased market reach, and faster or more effective communications. But there are downsides to all this digitalization uh, facilities, uh, such as the erosion of competitive advantage, new sources of risk, and a shift in power to buyers and platforms. So digital technologies, allow mature and new firms to expand internationally, capturing opportunities in foreign countries without the same financial burdens and risks traditionally associated with foreign investments. Because of this, digital technologies lead businesses to reconsider the arguments that shape their internationalization strategy. On the one hand, Digitalization facilitates IB by dramatically reducing transaction and coordination costs, thus facilitating globalization. In fact, many entrepreneurs of born digital firms start from a, a born global default mindset. On the other hand, though, most digital firms still have to deal with national formal and informal institutions that they may be able to leverage to create an advantage, but they may also become an obstacle to implementing a global business model. Moreover, national endowments with resources supporting digital business shape decisions about where firms might locate such activities. So digitalization presents IB researchers with two main challenges. First, understanding how digital technologies will impact existing firms, their international operations and processes. The second big issue is understanding new digital businesses and the way they internationalize. One main question is, can existing theories still be used to explain the internationalization of firms when digital technologies impact the way business is done and the business models firms use. We have three speakers today that will talk about some of these issues and present research looking at the intersection of IB and digitalization. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker. That would be uh, Shilpa Madam from the Virginia in the USA. And uh, Shilpa, if you're ready, you may take the floor. Thank you, Keith. Uh, here with you in a second. Thank you. The usual Zoom question. Are you able to see my slide? Yes. And able to hear me? Awesome. Thank yep. you. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you to AIB for putting together this webinar series and for giving me the opportunity to share our research with you today. This work looks at uh, how power distance, a cultural dimension shapes people's responses to data breaches across the world and is in collaboration with my fantastic co-authors, Krishna Savani and Kostas Kastikyas. Uh, without further ado, what do I mean by data breaches? 
So we follow the GDPR definition of data breaches, which is a breach of security, a personal, uh, a loss of personal data, unauthorized disclosure or access of personal data uh, to someone who is not authorized to use it. I want you to pay particular attention the specifics of this definition because we try and tackle each aspect of data breaches as understood by ordinary citizens in our uh, in our paper why study data breaches like why are they important to scholars of international business because they are absolutely pervasive uh, irrespective you know they transcend the boundaries of countries cultures uh, languages they are pervasive the last two years about the last year and a half have reported in excess of three and a half thousand data breaches 42 billion personal records have been compromised and many times data breaches only lead to you know innocuous side effects like uh, spam email, more spam email in your inbox, but many times they also lead to much more insidious side effects and consequences like identity theft and credit card fraud. And these are consumer consequences. There are big costs to businesses, the cost of managing data breaches and loss of reputation for businesses is expected to reach in excess of $5 trillion by 2024. And as we saw with the Cambridge Analytica scandal in 2018 in the United States, data breaches also have the power to shape democracies and how governments function. So that's the more practical reason why we want to study how people respond to data breaches. A more academic reason is that a lot of research has studied what makes people share their data online, like their privacy concerns. But I'm sure you will agree, as internet has become more pervasive and digital transactions have taken over our life, especially through and after COVID, sharing our data online is a moot point. We all share data all the time. What we are now interested in is how do we react, how we as consumers, as individuals, as users, react when we discover that the data we shared with firms has been compromised. Specifically, also because we are business scholars, we are interested in how knowing or learning about a data breach impacts people's willingness to continue transacting with that business in the future going forward. So how did we develop our conceptual model? The first thing that you notice when you are an Indian living in the United States is that there are huge discrepancies in how people back home and people here respond to data breaches. And a little bit of digging into anecdotal data and industry research showed us that in the United States, about 21% consumers said that they are continue to willing to patronize an app, a retailer or a business even after experiencing a data breach. This number goes up slightly for people in the UK who said about 24% of them are still okay and willing to transact with the business after a data breach. Now, get ready for a shocker. This is the number for all of Asia where almost 96% people said that it does not matter that the app experienced a data breach, they will continue to use the app. Obviously, this is industry data. The methodologies are different. The questions are different. The targets are different. But it does give us some idea into the fact that there are cultural or country differences in how people respond to data breaches. And this, in turn, has implications for organizations. So should Apple react differently to a data breach in North America versus to a data breach in India or China? And we set out to figure out what shapes these differential responses and let's build our conceptual model together. So what predicts people's willingness to continue transacting or patronizing a business that has inadvertently or intentionally compromised their data? We argued that one reason people would be willing to continue working with the business it depends on their ownership attribution of their data. If you think that when you started working with that business, transacting with that business, 
you signed off your data to that business you gave the ownership of your data to that business then you are less concerned about the data breach you don't blame the business for losing your data and you are more willing to continue working with the business uh transacting with them despite the data breach on the other hand if you feel that the data belonged to you and the business was just taking care of them business was the custodian and managed to lose them you are more angry you tend to blame the business for losing your data and hence you are less likely to interact with them this in turn is shaped by one of the core cultural dimensions power distance by hofstede and this is the understanding power distance refers to the extent we accept hierarchy or authority in society this does not reflect actual disparity so this is not the gini coefficient but people's acceptance of hierarchy or inequality that exists in society a lot of research shows that east asian south asian countries are higher in power distance than most of the western world put together and we argue that power distance shapes people's ownership attributions about their data because people in high power distance countries put businesses at a higher level in the societal hierarchy think that businesses legitimately have greater authority in society and hence they are obligated or required to transfer ownership of their data to businesses when they start transacting with them consumers in high power distance countries are also more likely to take terms and conditions on face value saying you are signing off your data to facebook or tiktok or instagram for that matter and thus when such data is compromised it is the business's concern and not the user's concern and hence they are less likely to be bothered by a data breach and less likely to stop transacting with the business we test these a uh, hypothesis and a couple more which you can read in the paper across a series of seven studies i'm going to show you a few of these which i think do a nicer job of pulling all the evidence that we have together the first study that we did was with real world data this is a very famous app some of you might remember in 2019 it could show you how you would look if you were to get 10 20 30 40 years older celebrities all over the world were using it but then it came out that this app was in violation was uh, was conducting a data breach on your data by sending it to their global servers outside of your home country what we found is that users in high power distance countries highlighted in brighter pink on this slide continued to use um the app continued to download this app despite knowing that this app was in violation of data privacy laws and was sending their data abroad without their express consent as with all archival data we controlled for a host of factors but this relationship between power distance and willingness to continue using an app that you knew was the violating your privacy uh, was robust across countries in another study we actually recruited victims of privacy of a data breach in the last 12 months and we got a host of uh, uh, users in the united states who who experienced a data breach with google financial institutions educational institutions like harvard and university of uh, california los angeles and we replicated these results in a couple of other studies we provided causal evidence for the underlying mechanism all while using a lot of real world context of data breaches a particular study that i wanted to highlight is that um, singapore experienced a data breach violation when the government itself shared the data collected for the covid-19 contact tracing app with the police to solve a law case going back on its own previous commitment to the citizens that this data will never be shared outside of uh, the covid-19 protocols and we found that high power distance again predict uh users being okay with this sort of a data breach in summary uh we look at how consumers respond to data breaches which is a pertinent global issue in our digital first world it is a reality and something we have to live with 
past research has primarily studied the firm's perspective. How do firms manage data breaches and what happens to their stock prices when a data breach happens? We take a consumer perspective and try and figure out how firms can respond differentially to minimize business loss and how can policymakers protect the most vulnerable, the kind of consumers who are most likely to trust their data to businesses and then not be concerned about it. In terms of future research directions, there is absolutely so much to do. What about more consequential data breaches? What if you experience identity theft? Would your uh, power distance still predict your response to a data breach? How does migration, someone like me, having born and grown up in India and now in the United States, change my cultural beliefs and potentially my response to these consequential issues in the marketplace? How can we help consumers, users, ordinary people in countries become more aware of the impact of data breaches and the accountability that businesses should have for it? And finally, how can we uh, determine other antecedents and underlying mechanisms of people's responses to data breaches so we can advise not just businesses, but also policymakers on protecting the most vulnerable? Thank you so much, and I'd be happy to take any questions later when, uh, you know, when Keith is good at it. Thank you. Thank you, Silva. And I would like to remind the audience that uh, if you do have questions about the papers, please post them on the Q&A uh, that you'll find on the screen there, and then we'll be looking at those once all three papers have been presented. So our second paper today is, uh, is co-authored by uh, uh, Pank Pankaj uh, Kumar, who's also in Virginia. So uh, Pankaj, uh, over to you. But you have to unmute. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rufers, Professor Meyer, and Professor Minvayeva for organizing this and giving me the opportunity. Can everyone see the screen, please? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, so I think uh, my compliments the work of uh, Shelpa, which you heard before, that she talked about the destructive capabilities of digitalization. And this one uh, is talking about the constructive capabilities of uh, digitalization. Uh, the title is Cognitive Sources of Liability of Foreignness in Crowdsourcing Creative Work. And essentially, so it's a co-authored work by me, Swanan, and Sri. The question that we ask is, is there a liability of foreignness in online crowdsourcing contests for creative work? Uh, so as we all know that the, one of the constructive aspects of digitalization is, and uh, Professor Bruther has talked about it beforehand, that it has opened up some new means of how do we organize to work. And one of the relevant modes of, uh, of, that has drawn the attention of scholars and practitioners alike is the digital crowdsourcing context. I think it's going to be roughly like $157 billion market by 2027. And, 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 and in this, essentially any firm which seeks solutions to a creative problem or innovation problem, here the focus is on creative design, they can go online and relay their problem on a digital platform and the solvers disperse all over the world, the individuals disperse all over the world, compete in a timely fashion to solve that problem. So now notice that both the solvers and the solution seeker firms are globally dispersed. So essentially, if we try to think in terms of the, the, the most closer concept in IB, it would be like, uh, imagine if we simultaneously outsourced our problem, the same set of problem to numerous suppliers, uh, which is not the goal here, but just to give you a flavor uh, and, and try to do it in a cost efficient and timely manner. Now, in this crowdsourcing domain, most of the research have looked at how do we optimize the contest or how do we make the contest more efficient? And in terms of design, they have looked for unblind crowdsourcing context. What do I mean by that? 
Well, essentially in this unblind contest, the idea is to reduce the bias and improve the informational transparency by allowing the individual solvers to see what the other solver is doing in, in when they are, while they are solving the problem, they are also allowed to see when a solution seeker firm provides feedback to any of the solvers so that there is fairness in the system, it reduces the information asymmetry and biases. So essentially the default assumption is that when you move to the unblind format of the contest, uh, then the bias is gone because by definition, digitalization eliminates the transportation cost, communication cost. And on top of that, because of this informational transparency, the information asymmetry is, 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 is mitigated. Um, now, however, the, the, the thing which drew our attention is that this assumption, even in the unblind contest where there is informational transparency, uh, the international character of the context, notice that the solvers and the seekers were both uh, are globally dispersed. That international character was missing from the storytelling when we talk about there is no biases in the system, but since, since the, 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 the contest can be accessed from any country and the worldview of solvers as well as solution seeker firms managers may be influenced by their uh, national context, uh, it, it makes it, it it raises the question that is it true that if we consider the international nature of the un unblind contest, is it still without any biases? And that's where uh, uh, is it still without any biases? And that's where we are trying to investigate that is there a liability of foreignness? Now notice that. Here, the interesting thing of digitalization, especially in the crowdsourcing contest, if somebody might ask, okay, what is international here? If nobody left their country of origin, then what is international? And that's where we are trying to theorize and empirically test that, well, digitally, uh, folks are leaving their countries and, 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 and even that digital uh, leaving the country has some influence which systematically biases the selection processes. So here, the, the, the main hypothesis is that a solver from a different individual solver from a different country of origin than the seeker firm's focal country is less likely to have their design win in an online creative contest than a solver from the same country of origin uh, of the seeker firm. And the idea is that the locus, I mean, even studies, all the studies of creativity, the locus of creative work is 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 mind like individual mind so here cognition becomes important and especially under time setting if if a solver is in an international contest then more often than not in order to optimize their problem solving they are going to resort to the default mindset uh, and 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 going to take into consideration what they learned in their home country about how design works now you could argue that even if a solver forgets to incorporate the, 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 the solution from the seeker country, it might be exotic and the solution seeker firm might like it more. And that's where the other aspect of this problem that not only the generation of idea is biased by home country, the selection of idea is also biased by home country uh, where the seeker firm its managers also bias towards their home country solutions. So essentially, we look at some of the moderators, which might help alleviate this bias, which is solvers' depth and breadth of experience, and host country peer observation, which might help in the cognitive openness. Uh, and essentially, they act as moderators. We also look at some of the aspects of the solution seeker firms' managers, that if the firm is in technology industry and the international firms, they might be more open to looking at foreign ideas and that might mitigate the liabilities of foreignness. Uh, our data was essentially from a crowdsourcing platform that hosts unblind contests. Uh, the dependent variable was success in a contest, independent variable was foreignness. Moderators were breadth of our prior experience of solver, depth of prior experience, host peer observation, international firm, technology industry, and and the controls, there were a lot of solver and seeker related con controls. Uh, we broadly find support for our hypothesis. 
and we did a series of robustness check. And essentially uh, where we try to contribute is that we want to expand the research on online crowdsourcing contests by zooming in on the IV aspects of things. Also, we wanted to contribute to the LOF studies, which have mostly looked at capital market and product market. And we want to look if there is, besides these social and institutional underpinnings, maybe cognitive sources of the LOF become more prominent. Uh, we also contribute to the internationalization of creative work, which has mostly looked at generation and ignored the selection aspects and ignored the international aspects of creative work in a time setting. Um, and, and, uh, and, and hopefully uh, we add value to these, these works. So uh, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to the questions that you may have and, and hope you will read the paper. Thank you. Thank you very much. Quick and concise. All right, we have a third paper today. And uh, Catherine, oh man, I'm, I'm going to mess up the last name, but I'm going to try it anyhow, because that's the kind of guy I am. So it's Catherine Tatarinova? No. Tatarinov. Tatarinov. Yeah, well, I was close. So. You were very good. Oh, well, thank you, Catherine. I'm sure people will be more impressed with your paper than my pronunciation. Thank you very much, Keith. Thank you to the organizers, to AIB, for giving us the opportunity to share our work. Um, so today I'll be, I'm Catherine Tatarna from the University of Geneva. Today I'll be presenting a paper called Scaling Digital Solutions for Wicked Pro Problems, Ecosystem Versatility. And this is a paper co-authored with Professor Tina Ambos, also from the University of Geneva, and Professor Ted Chang from Singapore Management University. Uh, before I get started into the paper, I'd like to take two words on the context. So what we're looking at here is digital solutions that are born out of the United Nations agency agencies. These UN agencies are tasked with solving the world's wicked problems. So wicked problems are societal or cultural problems that are difficult or impossible to solve because of their complex and interconnected nature. So these can be problems such as hunger, poverty, uh, refugee migration patterns. And these UN agencies have recently started to use digital tools to address some of these wicked problems. And what they're doing is actually looking at these problems at a local level, but developing global solutions for these problems, which is the only way to solve this type of challenge. And so they use digital technologies such as artificial intelligence, blockchain, or geospatial mapping. And these are scaled to multiple countries and distributed by nature. So in line with recent IB research, we look at the configurations of these scaling processes through an ecosystem's lens. And here you have a picture of one of these solutions. So this is a uh, polling tool that started as an SMS-based solution from UNICEF. It's called U-Report, and she has it on her T-shirt there. And this tool is used to poll communities about taboo topics, such as relationships of students with teachers, or uh, certain specific topics that often those communities would not be comfortable sharing with. That information is then used to prioritize how the government addresses that problem in that specific country and how UNICEF as an agency can work to help that community. Before we get into the paper, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, how you define a digital solution at scale and why this is different from traditional uh, technology products. So digital solutions are innovations suited to solve complex problems using digital technology. And we identify that the, they have three characteristics that make them particularly interesting to look at when they scale. So the first is their layered modular architecture and their modularity, which are which means that they have components that can be combined into different configurations. Then we have generativity. This is the ability of these solutions to expand into and integrate with many domains. This is a term we took uh, from when people were discussing the, the development of the internet. And finally, they have affordances. So these are the actions that individuals or organizations can take to shape a technology to an often local problem. And we'll see how that plays into what happens when these solutions scale. Uh, we are coming from two theoretical perspectives. So the first perspective is actually on the traditional IB dilemma of replication adaptation. So this is a dilemma that looks at when you're scaling a product or a service, uh, you would like to replicate the model. But often 
uh, there's a, a dilemma there because certain aspects of that need to be adapted to the local environment. And how does that happen? Particularly when you have digital properties involved that often require specific um, applications within the local context. The second theoretical perspective we take is on scaling. So we look at the, the um, international scaling of ecosystems because we take this ecosystem perspective to look at the scaling of digital technologies. In IB literature, uh, scaling has been addressed by looking at the growth of entrepreneurial firms, which refers to high growth firms as scale-ups, uh, but never have we looked at the scaling of ecosystems uh, internationally. And together, this helps us answer the question of how are digital solutions for wicked problems scaled across locations and how are their ecosystems reconfigured uh, to facilitate that scaling? So in line with this question, we sample actually the ecosystems of each one of these solutions in each location that it's scaled to. And we look, we create these maps of who were the people involved in each location. So these are the four maps and we'll zoom in on, on one here. So this is the maps of a specific blockchain tool that was developed by a UN organization to transfer cash-based transfers for refugees in refugee camps using the blockchain. And this enabled this organization to bypass traditional third-party financial entities that were often corrupt, particularly in war-torn uh, environments, or could not be trusted, or that as uh, building on what Shilpa was talking about, there were data breaches uh, to avoid certain situations like that. So they actually were able to transfer the money now from their wallets, the organization's wallet, to the wallet of the refugees that could then use that uh, cash directly in the refugee camp. And this was a digital solution that started in Pakistan in 2017. Uh, and you can see the we were able to label the different roles that the ecosystem entities took on. So you see that the orchestrator role, for example, was the organization's innovation accelerator. And this orchestrator role mobilizes the network globally, and they provide legitimacy for scaling the digital solution. Interestingly, uh, which has previously not been identified, we identified an integrator role. In previous literature, this orchestrator and integrator role have been mixed into one. And since these organizations uh, have a very difficult time with uh, technology resourcing, they don't have a lot of resources in general, they don't have a lot of know-how in terms of tech, they often would take on this integrator role that would help them link to the complementers who could then eventually uh, provide value-adding services and resources to implement the solution in the new location. Uh, and these complementers would also grant access to the end user, which would enable the generativity necessary for the digital solution to scale. And so this integrator role really enabled the access to the local, local knowledge and partners and activated the affordances involved in this scaling process. Uh, what we see here at the bottom is actually the application. So how was this tool, this blockchain tool applied in each location? And we see in Pakistan, it was a cash uh, transfer. It was cash transferred through a blockchain backed system for distributing and recording cash transactions. It was integrated at the front end with existing iris scanning technology that was rolled out by UNHCR in the refugee camp. So the iris, the refugee would scan their irises at the shop in the refugee camp and they would be granted a digital identity. And that's how they would were able to identify their wallets, for example. The same was used uh, in Jordan in 2018. UNHCR did not have the technology in the Bangladesh camp in 2020, and so it was a simple QR code for digital identity. But this really shows the modularity that was enabled to plug in these different types of technologies in the digital solution uh, and enable the tool to scale. What we see here is that the ecosystem, so the different players who are involved, can be both global and local. And for this specific tool, they actually stayed relatively uh, the same over time. Uh, so the case has revealed to us, actually, that, uh, that the international scaling of digital solutions requires complex interactions uh, of the core technology and the ecosystem, the different entities involved as it scales. And so we developed this, uh, this model that shows the different ways in which digital solutions scale. What's really important here are these two axes. So first, it's that the digital, the characteristics that I highlighted at the beginning actually 
have a strong influence in the way that the tool is applied to different locations. So we saw the modularity in the blockchain tool was important to enable the tool for the most part to stay the same. It was still a cash-based transfer blockchain tool throughout, but plug in uh, different other technologies along the way. Uh, for different tools, for example, the U-Report initiative that I mentioned at the beginning, that tool changed completely in the way it was applied across locations. So in certain locations, it was used for uh, discussing certain taboo topics such as teachers and others it was used for earthquake analysis, uh, volcano prediction and so forth. So we see that this, this actually changed the way it was applied in different locations. On the left side, we see the ecosystem. So what changed and what implied how the Im impacted how the ecosystem changed, this was the relationship between the orchestrator and the integrator. So you see if it was an intra-organizational relationship such as we had with the blockchain tool, so it was the innovation accelerator and a subsidiary office, it stayed fairly the same over time. Whereas if it was an inter-organizational relationship, so multiple organizations involved, the ecosystem actually changed. And these findings really show that combining the properties of the digital solution with the ecosystem uh, configuration is key to understanding how these solutions scale uh, and overall, I'd say our study adds to the stream of research that extends internationalization theory to the digital world and suggests that the classic replication adaptation dilemma may be overcome with digital solutions. We also define the roles in ecosystems and link them to the properties of the digital solutions, showing which roles uh, really enable different parts of the digital solutions uh, to, to manifest themselves. Uh, so these are, this is the main contributions in terms of future research. There's still, like Shilpa said, so much more to do here. Uh, the first is this is a qualitative phenomenon based research. And I think it would be amazing to see uh, quants scholars start to quantify some of these metrics and measure the success of which types of configurations work best for what type of goals and really test some of our qualitative findings using these quantitative methodologies. Um, the second mainstream of future research, which I think would be very important, uh, would be to look at the micro foundations of scaling these digital solutions, particularly in the context of the grand challenges or the wicked, the wicked problems. Um, I see that within each of these organizations, there were individual champions who were really pushing these partnerships, working together and scaling these tools. So looking at the micro foundations of that, uh, their incentives, their goal structures, how this differs and how they're able to overcome some of these goal challenges. And finally, a third is the tensions of digital transformation. We see these tools are enabling the UN to uh, solve their challenges, solve their missions better, but it's also changing how they work internally. So they're actually going through a digital transformation. We've seen a few papers quite recently looking at the micro foundations, um, micro level tensions of digital transformation, when we add scaling to that, particularly international scaling, what does that mean? And how does that imply the relationships, the micro-level relationships within those organizations? So I look forward also to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm looking at my uh, question list and there are only a few questions right now. So please remember to post your questions in the Q&A part. I saw some people were posting in the chat, so I will eventually get to the chat, but I am gonna start in the, in the uh, Q&A session here. So uh, uh, the first question is a question to uh, Shilpa. The usage of apps despite breaching their policy by the Asians majorly could be due to lack of awareness also. So, Yeah, uh, Smitha, that's a very interesting question and one that we did grapple with in our research. And as I wrote to you, we handle it in three different ways. First, where we are making cross-cultural comparisons, like, you know, across the 58 countries that I showed you for study one, we control for things like GDP, education, uh, you know, whether English is their first language or not. There's only so much you can do at a granular level when you're looking at the global level. Uh, the second way we control for it is that a lot of our studies assess 
within country variations in power distance and offer causal evidence. So we inherently control for differences between the Western world and Asians in their knowledge or awareness about data breaches. And the third and the most compelling way we handle for you know, the differences or asymmetry in uh, awareness or lack of it about the consequences of data breaches among our participants is that all our stimuli from studies three to seven, where we actually give them stimuli to read, specifies that what are the, this is something that happened to you or a friend, and what are the consequences of something like this happening? So what could be the potential consequences of this data breach? So we eliminate that asymmetry in awareness by actually telling them what this is about and then recording their responses to it. And we still find that despite telling them that all these bad things potentially could happen because of this data breach, their power distance beliefs or the condition as they were in, in experimental research, predicts their response uh, to that data breach and their willingness to continue transacting with the Facebook, with Twitter, with the, you know, with the Singapore government, with the other organizations that have lost their data subsequently. So we do that in three ways. I hope that answers your question. Thank you for asking. Thank you very much for the response. Yeah, I assume this question is, is suggesting that in some countries, you know, they it's public knowledge when there's a data breach. You know, you're you're required by law to publish it or let everybody know. Where in other countries, it may be a secret. And and I know many times in the US, I've seen that, you know, you're not told about the data breach for six or eight or 10 months after it happens. So this awareness might actually vary. I know one way you controlled for that in your study was you actually did these experiments so that all the players had the same information. Uh, but in real life, of course, uh, there is this big variation. And so there might be some issues that, that come about uh, on the, the basis of, you know, do we need better government regulations about the awareness? All right, thank you very much. So uh, question number two, and this one, I guess, is going in perfect order here uh, to uh, Pan Pankaj. Uh, how does the power distance concept relate to the view that business customer power relationships are changing over since the emergence of the computer industry? So. I think they're trying to suggest possibly that the power distance concept might be different from the sort of the business customer power relationship, especially now with digitalization where customers have more power. Oh, sorry. I thought I unmuted myself, but no. Uh, this is an absolutely fascinating question because to me, as a culture scholar, it pertains to how cultures change and what environmental stimuli changes or shifts our cultural values to be more egalitarian, for example, because power distance is about hierarchy. What is happening in the environment that could make us more toward equality or as consumers in high power distance cultures do, instead of pitting uh, you know, uh, businesses higher up in the societal hierarchy above them, start considering businesses as partners or at the equal level as them, as consumers or users in low power distance countries. So obviously, and I completely agree that internet is a force that's democratizing our relationships with businesses. And we will gradually see a change where consumers, hopefully also in high power distance countries, stop putting businesses on a pedestal because businesses have huge resources and can do many things, but start thinking of businesses as partners in creating a better society because internet has given consumers many tools to push back to consumers to voice their outrage on Twitter or Facebook or to complain very openly that did not exist before. But I think this will be a very gradual process that will take time because culture doesn't um, 
culture doesn't become what it is in a matter of a few years it will take at least several decades if not several centuries to come about of course i agree that it may happen sooner for the younger generation people who grown up with the internet and but will take time to happen at a population level i was also reading another question and it ties in with that you know chinese the young chinese uh, and in my past work with unilever i used to work with a lot of young chinese people I have started calling their bosses by their first name and the hierarchy levels might be disappearing but trust me if you sample at a population level if you sample at you know at various age cohorts you will still see a huge difference in power distance and how accepting of hierarchy uh, at a overall level consumers or people in china are versus people in the united states or canada or the scandinavian countries for example i'm happy to take that question up later once it comes up but robert to great question and one that i think about often if you're more interested about how cultures change and uh, things that move the culture needle in different ways i have another paper in the proceedings of the national academy of sciences where we look at how choice or the proliferation of choice may be shifting the needle toward global individualism from collectivism so another cultural value of of states and how it may be changing the barometer of what the world values towards more individualistic i me myself kind of beliefs Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pankaj, sorry about that. Read the wrong one, but you're up now here. Huh? So do, guess, please go ahead. do solution seeker firms crowdsource their customers' urgent problems? Yes. So I think I think even the first one, it could also be that he might be asking because he's using the term customer. So I'm assuming. So I'll try to answer both of them that in, in my context, the customer becomes the business, right? So the actual customer is the business who is asking the question and the individual solvers are solving the question. Now, if I think that what happens to the power distance, well, I could argue that it is increasing. Think about this. So for example, before in our IB context, when we are talking about outsourcing, a firm is outsourcing to one supplier. Now I'm moving the contest. See, it's individual solvers and it's a design contest, but I'm trying to respond to a broader question here. That a firm was outsourcing to a particular supplier. Of course, the supplier is trying to provide cheaper product or innovative product. That doesn't matter, but it's one supplier or one out of 50. Here, the firm is asking 50 different workers to work for free, supposedly, where they can see their solutions and pick the best one and only the winner gets the award. Of course, you could argue that other individuals got the reputation, got the learning, but the thing is they didn't get paid and they spend their times. So, so, so if I have to take a different angle, I don't know. I mean, this is a very interesting question and, 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 and future food for thought of what happens to the digital power distance which which might also transcend the cultural power distance as we know in the sense because it's giving more powers now think from another angle who is in charge well the platform is in charge for example amazon is a platform if i am firm and i'm trying to sell through amazon i can anyway amazon has more incentive to sell that some items or features of platform to me as a firm because they can make more money from me by saying, hey, do you want to increase your review? Do you want to increase your visibility? Do you want to give, like, respond to the questions where one customer might be genuine but negative? You know, so they are, so it's giving more and more, so it, it's giving rise to more and more businesses also who will take care of the, the other side of equalizing benefit of customers. And that's potentially makes it a very good research question or future research question of how does it evolve. Now, the second question that you asked that do solution seeker firms, uh, crowdsource their customers' urgent problems. So here I'm assuming that that seeker firms, the kind of questions that they ask, is it that they pick their customers' urgent problems and given? So so okay, that, that's that's again a good question, again a food for future research. But then I'm not running away from responding it. In my context, it's a design problem. So 
I am so for the most part, it's the solution seeker firm which is asking a question which it needs to solve for itself. Okay, uh, and now. I also, it is urgent in the sense that it's in a time setting. The contracts have like three weeks, seven days, 10 days. So it's in a time setting in that sense, it's urgent. Now, if the question were, if I were a hospital in the healthcare industry, right? And if my client is needing some urgent diagnosis in a very specialized medical care, would I do a crowdsourcing contest? Let's say, assume I take care of the privacy issues. Would I go in for a crowdsourcing contest and trust a stranger? I don't know. The closest I can tell you is NASA. For example, if NASA has to go to space and they can engage in crowdsourcing contest, physical crowdsourcing contest, they have not gone in for digital, then somewhere I am assuming that they also trust the wisdom of the crowd. Some of the drug manufacturing companies have made their non-monocular entity selection online. So I am assuming that they are at least uh, trusting the wisdom of the crowd when it comes to screening for diseases. So in that sense, I could bend it towards, yes, they might uh, crowdsource their customer's urgent problem, but understand, this is a loaded question because it has two steps. Will the customer trust the solution seeker firm for making their private question online? And that in itself is a different question. And then the second question is, will the solution seeker firm disclose its role as just a contractor? Think about this. So right now I am handling my client's problem if I expose myself to others that I am just a middleman or a broker where I pick somebody else's problem and using you to solve it, what will happen to me when platform is itself a broker? Well, some other individual can take care of that problem. So that, that those things are, uh, are, are something for future research to discuss. All right, great, thank you. And Catherine, your turn. I've got two of them because I think they're related somehow, it's, uh, but you'll let us know if they are. Uh, so what do you think of the adoption of digital technology in countries left behind in the digital economy, right? Uh, underdeveloped countries in the Pacific Islands, what type of organizations play the accelerator role in any idea on the ecosystem and scaling? And to me, that's sort of related to this next question that asks about the ecosystem concept and whether it's really necessary. So maybe your answer could sort of cover them both there. Okay, great. Thank you, Keith. And also thank you for the questions. I think they're both excellent questions. On the first one, there are specific organizations working on bringing connectivity and bringing these countries that have been left behind in the digital uh, have been left behind the digital economy up to speed. So for example, there's a partnership between UNICEF and and ITU, which is the International Telecommunications Union, to actually bring connectivity to every school in the world. So this is a project called Giga and I've dropped the link into the the Q&A. Uh, so they are, have a very ambitious plan to connect every school in the world to the internet. And the idea is that the school acts as a proxy for the rest of the community. If the school is connected to the internet, then eventually the rest of the community will become connected to the internet, eventually the whole country. Very interestingly, we don't know how many schools there are in the world. So no person actually knows how many schools there are in the world. So in order to first connect them, you have to map them. And so they're using several, you know, very complicated geo, geospatial mapping, machine learning algorithms to actually look at the world, to map the world and try to understand how many schools exist before we can start to connect them. So this is happening. I think these organizations are working on this. Interestingly, during COVID, when children could not go to school and had to stay at home, this became a major issue because they were learning online. And when you can't connect to the internet, yes, there may be naysayers who are saying that the internet is not great for kids, they should be outside playing. But if you can't get an education uh, because you're not connected to the internet, this becomes a huge problem. So I would say there are several large organizations working and several large government donors actually providing a lot of money for this. So I know specifically for uh, Project Giga, they've just raised an enormous amount of money to be able to roll out this project globally. So it, so it is happening. So optimistic response on this one. Uh, they're trying to, to catch up many of these uh, countries. 
Uh, the second question on ecosystems versus networks, I think, was the real question. I think we chose ecosystems here because it aligns very closely with what's been written in IB literature in the past in the way that ecosystems work. Uh, they're very purpose-driven ecosystems, so it's much more goal-oriented than a pure network. Uh, so you have these players specifically coming in for this solution. It's not just a network. It's really an ecosystem working together where everybody takes a specific role uh, and we were able to actually code those roles, uh, as mentioned. So it's much more intricate and purpose-driven than a pure uh, network. All right, great. And I see there's one more for you here about uh, the theoretical choices you made. Uh, so were the theoretical choices clear from the start, or did you consider alternative theories to explain your interesting findings? Uh, maybe I start behind this research comes from a broader research where we have been studying the UN organizations and their innovation and their transformation for quite a few years. And this is just one part of that research. For this specific paper, we are very clear from the beginning. And that's perhaps why it was also uh, much cleaner to write, much, much easier to write, and, and perhaps got published quicker as well than some of our other work. Uh, for some of the other phenomenon based, and I see there's another question on uh, how do you find a theoretical grounding for phenomenon-based research? It is much more difficult and you do have to, it is an iterative process. Uh, you do have to test some ideas and maybe go back and forth a little bit uh, between the theory and the data and, um, and you know, where are you going to position this? So I think for this paper, for us, it was very clear. It was clearly an ecosystems paper. Uh, it was clearly a scaling paper. Uh, for others, it, it's a little bit more difficult. All right, great. Great. All right, and I have some unanswered questions, although I see uh, Shilpa, you just answered one, so I'll have to go find that again. Mm -hmm. So, and this is sort of an open question to all, and it's actually an excellent question. So how difficult is it to find a theoretical grounding for studies in the digital context? And I'm gonna let all of you try a little answer to that. Right, so because a lot of the digital context is more a phenomenon driven idea, right? That it, it's just digital, where some it's doing the same thing we did before, only doing it digitally. So, is it hard to find a, a theory to help explain this, or do we just use the same theories we've always used? Who would like to say, Shilpa, you want to go first on this one? Totally. And I will build on what Catherine said. And this is not a very, uh, this is perhaps not a very insightful answer, is that one, digital changes consumer context. So people think and behave differently when shopping in store versus shopping on mobile. So we do know that digital as a medium shapes how people think, feel, and behave. So I am not sure that 100% the same theories that work in the brick and mortar world will also work on digital. So there's opportunity for us as researchers, as IB scholars to think how the context which seems very sort of pervasive and mundane now can actually change how we are as users, consumers, employees, and so on and so forth. Second, to build on Catherine's point, it is sometimes an iterative process you think of something, you test it out, you know, you have a hunch, you've read your uh, literature, you understand the phenomena, you've done your qualitative work, you've met consumers or employees or whatever your context may be, and you test some explanations and see if that holds ground. Second, what you do is you submit a paper to an excellent journal where you get fantastic feedback. Hopefully you will get an r, r but our process with this particular paper at JID uh, and uh, Keith was the editor there, we had a fantastic uh, review process. Our reviewers suggested, our reviewers teased us, our reviewers challenged us, and our reviewers were extremely insightful on what else could be causing this, which wasn't the same explanation as the brick and mortar world compared to digital. So, so while the paper went in as a digital phenomena paper, it came out, I would like to believe, you know, I would really like to believe as something that contributes to both theory in culture while explaining a digital first phenomena because data breaches are unlikely to occur in the physical first world, for example. So my answer is threefold. 
Uh, digital is not just a contact. Um, we do ourselves a disservice if we just, you know, write off all digital phenomena as saying just the modality is changing and nothing else changes. I think there's a lot of psychology research that shows that the phenomena changes the actor. Uh, second, it's, uh, you know, you are the expert on your in your field. So you will, a research is an iterative process. You will try something and then hopefully you will be lucky with fantastic reviewers and editors who will encourage you to build that theory and the consequences, you know, the outcomes and implications further during the review process. Does that right. sound Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, Pankaj, I'm going to go to you because especially on your paper, you guys use liability of foreignness, right, yes. to explain your phenomena. Yes. And I was sort of thinking, well, why didn't you use country of origin to explain yes. that? Yes. Um, so how do you come up with this theory? So, well, so the country of origin popped up and even Sri was also saying that maybe we should go in for a country of origin uh, story. Uh, but uh, at the, the, the reason we came up with liabilities of foreigners was that we were not sure at that or we didn't want to take into like much finer detail of is it a difference in kind? or even within a difference in kind, do certain countries matter differently based on prestige? So for example, had we gone to the country of origin side of the story, mm -hmm. the question could also be, and I'm making it up in a different context is, for example, if I create an app of uh, learning in Hindi, Hindi app, maybe my country of origin will help me because they will say, okay, if he talks in Hindi, you see, and then some other country of origin who don't talk in Hindi, it might not help them, even though they might be from the developed country or any other country. So there, we needed much more finer grain data about the research design problem that was being asked and the country of origin of the designers and much more deeper knowledge of design to execute that in a problem uh, in, 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 in that paper. And that's where the argument tilted in, in terms of traction we didn't have the, I mean, we thought in terms of the given the time constraint, we didn't have the capability to, to precisely delineate that which country is super cool in design, which elements of the design will be picked up for that particular question. And we avoided going there. Now, speaking to the broader question, I think generally it's always a discussion about abductive and deductive research. And even if we look at Nan Lin case studies, and let's say, even if it's a phenomena, so, so I'm not taking sides here. I'm saying, let's say it's a phenomena and we write a paper on phenomena, even then after doing the empirical analysis or case studies, we have to come up with the theory that what is the contribution? What did we learn that can be generalized to other, uh, to a broader audience? And, and there I would say that even then you will be forced to think in terms of what you already know. And normally in any streams, international business strategy, or, or a strategic management, any stream, normally six or seven broader theoretical pillars exist at a particular time, right? So it's always good to know about those seminal theories. And we have these panelists whom I thank, right? So they have created some seminal papers, like go through that, go through those basic six or seven foundations and think in terms of what is it that is being added there or what is it that can be modified? Some of the relevant discussions I, uh, were going on that is emerging market just a context or is it changing the IB theory? I also recommend reading some of the papers and the discussions, which is pretty fine that some folks say we are learning something new. Some folks say, hey, it's essentially like a firm internationalizing form the first time. It's not nothing new. So, so it's, it, it's a mix of both. And as, as both the scholars talk about that, it's an iterative process. So at the end of the day, yes, we write the hypothesis first, we run the analysis, but then again, we go back and refine. And it will give you a pretty good idea of, can I use the existing theory? Does that theory dominate? Or let's say if you are changing like 80% or more than 50% of whatever that existing theory says, then I will do an empirical research and I will op openly say I'm doing a case study or empirical research and I'm adding to a theory and, and, and try to, to, to work within that bounds. 
that's, well, that, that's that leads to Catherine very well because that's yeah. sort of what you did, didn't you, Catherine? Yes. You, you yes, know. exactly. And 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 I would like to also second everything that Shilpa said about the review process on this specific yes. paper. I mean, this this was one of the fastest uh, review processes and the most constructive, I would say. And actually, Keith, that's what led us to this. And first, we we did come also as Shilpa, I think, as well from a very digital perspective. And then adding that replication adaptation, which is a pure IB piece and really connecting it uh, with the framework there is, is what led to the development of the theory uh, and, and to building on the existing theory with the digital. And then seconding what Pankaj said on um, is emerging markets a context? I mean, we struggle with this on grand challenges. Is grand challenges a context or is grand challenges uh, something that's going to fundamentally change the theory? So there are quite a few different, not just digital digitalization and, and digital transformation, but also uh, grand challenges, emerging markets. So I think there's quite a few different um, pulling mechanisms right now in the in the discourse that's changing how we see these theories and, and how we discuss them. Okay, great, great. Let's see, uh, next question has to do with uh, international business digitalization, do immigrant entrepreneurs have more advantage over non-immigrants? Now, we don't really have a paper that looks at any of that. But, <coughs> excuse me. That, of course, would, uh, would uh, be an interesting research topic. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd rather actually go to the next question here, which I, unfortunately is just for Shilpa, but we might actually widen it a bit. So let's start with it going to you, which is talking about, uh, you know, are there nuances in this uh, data breach if it's dealing with a startup or an SME or an MNE or a state-owned enterprise? You're uh, muted though. Oh, yes, no, I, I did not think that the question was for me because it involved conducting research with these organizations, but I can totally take it from the angle uh, that you recommended, Keith. So this is actually a future research direction that we added to the paper that we think, so how is the, so why do we say that high power distance consumers are more willing to uh, you know, continue transacting with the businesses that lost their data? That's because these consumers put businesses at a higher pedestal, at a higher level in the societal hierarchy. Now, obviously, this cannot be true for all businesses, right? So a consumer in the United States would put probably Procter & Gamble or Unilever or these large behemoths like Citibank or, you know, these days behemoths also fall. Who would have thought about Credit Suisse, for example? But uh, consumers do tend to put big businesses on a pedestal. But what about a small startup? But what about, you know, a, a family owned, a small family owned business or a, or a small women owned enterprise? So we do think that the type of business will moderate our effects and we will be more likely to see them when the business is genuinely large and authoritative and has a massive presence versus to compared to a startup or a young fledgling business, which consumers will be less likely to put on a pedestal or higher than themselves in the societal hierarchy. So this is indeed one of our future research directions and something I'm currently working on. So great idea. Thank great. you. And Pankaj, we could actually take this idea into yours because what if the sort of the seeker, the, the person trying to find the solution is, an SME or a startup or an ME, yes. or what if the one providing the solution is one of these? Are you going to see differences there? So, so in our setting, since the paper is there, I have to defend it, but then I will respond to what I actually did. <laughs> <laughs> control for the developed and developing countries. So that's a technical answer, but this is a very good question in the sense that I think somebody, not, I, I don't remember who said it, but somebody said, once you write down a problem, it's completing half of the solution. Now the question is, if it's an emerging market firm, and then if it's a startup or SME, do they know how to figure out the problem, especially when it comes to creativity or innovation for that matter? The second thing is, since most of the platforms which have lots of scaling, they are in English. 
So is there any linguistic barriers? Again, we control for that, but still it remains a good question and simply saying controlling for that doesn't help because we all know that they have found evidence that the shorter the headline, the stock market increases, but that has no meaning in that sense. So yes, we control for it. Still the problem remains that how do they take care of the linguistic issues when they are typing a problem? Now, how do they take care of, again, in the selection side of the problem that if they, if they are highly contextualized in emerging markets, then do other international solutions affect them more or, or whether they will block out because the consumers are completely different uh, for an SME or for a startup, unless they are digitally global. So I think those are very interesting questions to pursue in our context too. Okay, great, great. And Catherine, I'm even gonna bend it so you get to play in this. So, because, I mean, you've got these solutions, right? These digital solutions, but someone had to develop them. So again, are these developed by SMEs or MNEs and who owns the solution? Certainly not the UN, for example, the, the ones you're showing us. So somebody's developed it and how do they get paid for all this? Surprisingly, actually, it is the UN who owns them and they've been outsourcing this to the SMEs and to these, uh, the complementers. Uh, right. Or it's a partnership where the SMEs and the partners actually provide the service for free. Uh, the data scientists, for example, quite a few universities there uh, that, that get a lot of data out of this type of relationship, but are able to provide these UN organizations uh, free insights, for example. And so, yes, the UN owns them. And so they roll them out and they use their legitimacy globally. Uh, I think also there is a little bit of, of question on how do you work with these organizations to do research? The UN, as we all know, is traditionally quite closed and very secretive. Uh, so it was quite difficult to get into uh, these organizations. And it took us a lot of time, a lot of building of trust to be able to get so many interviews and so much data and really access to their partners as well. So I think, uh, yes, this is, is a very interesting context. Um, but once you're able to get in, it's it's so different, so unique. And you're able because they're quite behind on a lot of the digital transformation, you're able to look at it in real time, which is always amazing as a researcher. Yeah. Okay, all right, great, great. I don't actually see any more questions from the audience, but I happen to have some, <laughs> a, although some of them have already been asked. So uh, let's see. Uh, now, I sort of talked about this, uh, Catherine, on yours, this idea of well, what happens you know, you talked about going into Bangladesh and in Jordan, and I mean, no offense to these countries, but their digital infrastructures are not that great. So some of these solutions may not actually be possible. Now, I assume modularity helps solve some of the problem, but, but are, are some of these solutions that they're developing only useful once the digital ecosystem gets caught up. So interestingly, because these solutions are rolled out at the global level and not at the local level, they're addressing local problems, but through global solutions, the people that are rolling out these solutions are not necessarily the schools or the communities on the ground. It's actually these UN organizations and their offices within that uh, country or the government offices, which usually have quite a bit of access to digital, if not all the remote communities don't. I mean, there's some exceptions, like such as, for example, the U report, which actually polls community. So you have to have the user interaction there. And here it's very interesting. So the modularity enables them, for example, in uh, certain African countries to use text messages. So SMS, which has become quite prevalent, whereas in other more uh, countries that are more accessible by Facebook, WhatsApp, they're able to use these different solutions. And then even going one step further, now they're using artificial <laughs> intelligence. So the, you see that this modularity, um, the affordances allows the people on the ground to actually start to interact with the technology in a way that they can, and in a way that they're allowed to, given the tools that they have. Okay, okay. Right. Yeah, I think that might make an interesting twist in there somehow. It's a, now, one more question on these. I mean, you looked at these big solutions by big international organizations. Does this idea of, you know, of you know, expanding digital solutions, wouldn't this also apply to like M&Es once they create a digital solution in one country, 
Wouldn't they want to expand it to subsidiaries and partners in other countries? And do you think your ideas would work for the firm as it does for like uh, the UN? I think so. I mean, traditionally, the firm has taken on the role of both the orchestrator and the integrator because they have a lot more cap capabilities in-house to do this. The UN is very resource constrained, which creates an even more extreme environment. They're not able to do all these parts. Uh, but at the same time, what the UN has that the private sector doesn't have is this legitimacy and these boots on the ground. So some of these international organizations have 180 what you would call subsidiaries or field offices globally, which an m and &E, a traditional m and &E, yes, there may be a few that have such global reach, but not that many, right? And so they have this incredible legitimacy, people on the ground at each country with local interactions. They understand the community. They understand what's going on. So I think they're an integral part of these ecosystems for scaling, specifically solutions for wicked problems, uh, and specifically in that context. Whether they're an orchestrator and an m and &E can be the orchestrator and they plug in, I think that's, you know, maybe that's a question that can be tested, what role they should play. Uh, but, a, but yes, I think an m and &E could orchestrate it uh, and then, you know, maybe use the UN uh, for their legitimacy, for their their boots on the ground and their knowledge, local knowledge, to work together to solve these problems together. But absolutely, I think there's there's a lot of parallels that can be drawn there. Okay, great, great. Uh, uh, Pankaj, uh, I've got another one for you, although my country of origin was the big one for your paper, of course. But this idea of, would it matter what the question is they're trying to get a solution for as to, as to this bias against some countries or another country? Would they maybe ask a question that they would think could be answered by people in country X better than in country Y? So I think then my response would be twofold that since the firm, so, so yes, it would matter. Like if the firm is thinking like that, <laughs> It would matter, but uh, here the firm is self-selecting into a platform which has presence in multiple countries. Uh, so I'm assuming that they are open to solutions from all, all countries, but let's say if the firm picks a particular country, then I would say that they would, might not go in through the crowdsourcing route on a platform which has access to like 100 countries. They might simply opt in for that specific country and go in, go in for something internal. But then again, that's my opinion. And, yeah. and, 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 and here I'm assuming that if the firm is openly going in for and selecting into a platform, then they are open to the solutions too. Yeah, I, I was thinking more of they'd be biased towards the responses to a particular country as opposed to restricting, we only want answers from a particular country, but yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, and one last one for uh, Shilpa. Now, you talked about power distance and how power distance, of course, might impact the reaction to these data breaches. But there are uh, lots of other cultural dimensions, like the, this, you know, attitude towards risk or individual and collectivism. Won't some of these also impact how people respond to a data breach? So Keith, uh, clearly this is coming from someone who's read the paper very carefully. <laughs> Keith was our editor, for those who don't know. So uh, yes, absolutely. So first thing that you do, uh, you know, in culture research, uh, also experimental culture research, if I may say, is that you try and understand which exactly of these uh, dimensions is causing your effect. So we tried to do that to the best of our ability, both from a theorization point of view, like, why does it make sense to argue that it is power distance that shapes people's ownership attributions and not individualism, collectivism, or not long-term orientation, or not, you know, masculinity, femininity, for example. So you, we did that theorization, and I hope when you read the paper, this is more for the audience, uh, you will see that we do a good job on uh, justifying or explaining why it is power distance and none of these other uh, cultural dimension. Second thing that you do to obviously to reassure yourself that you've gone, you know, you've come to the right antecedent and not a spurious artifact is you try and control or try and rule out these other cultural dimensions, which we do in different ways. We control for them at a country level in, 
in the cross-cultural study, the study I showed you across 58 countries. We also measure these in some of our other studies and try to rule them out. And finally, actually, one study that I did not speak about is that uncertainty avoidance does moderate our effect such that it shapes people's responses that even if they are high in power distance, but they're very high in uncertainty or avoidance, because the data breach always opens a lot of questions, right? So what will happen to my data? Will I be subjected to an identity theft or a credit card fraud? If these consumers are high in uncertainty avoidance, then they do not want to continue transacting with the business despite being high in power distance. Even if they think that the firm had their data and they had given their data to the firm, they do not want something bad to happen to their data. So a long answer to a short question, but that's how we tackled to make sure that we were at the right cultural dimension when it came to uh, privacy breaches, data breaches. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. And we're starting to run out of time here. I would like to thank our three speakers. Uh, very interesting papers. Have you noticed they all have different methods of testing the ideas? They all have different theories they're testing or develop new theory. So this, as I said earlier, digitalization has really opened up the IB field. I remember maybe 20 years ago that scholars would come, especially young scholars and say, oh, everything's been done. There's nothing new. Well, everything's new now because you have digital firms that are different from brick and mortar firms. You have brick and mortar firms trying to figure out what to do with digital technologies. It's a fabulous place to be doing research. The papers you heard today are three really great ones. We have several more in this special issue. So I encourage you to take a look at the, the advanced copies of these on JIBS, and they hopefully will soon be coming out in JIBS. Uh, Klaus, I don't know if you have a few words you'd like to say. Well, I, it remains for me to say thank you to everyone for your contribution. It was a very stimulating uh, conversation. And there are a lot of issues coming up in the conversation that indicates you continue to do research on this. And I look forward to seeing that uh, coming out in due course uh, in, in, in JIPS or, or wherever else you choose to, to publish. Um, I just want to say one thing on this on the big question of theory, because it, that pumps popping up in, in a lot of these conversations, because the journals always ask, uh scholars to what, what's your theoretic contribution my observation or my perception of this subfield is at this stage there are a lot of phenomena that are new and what we really need to do is to understand those phenomena and to, to do that very often applying existing theory is helps us to what's that goal we don't necessarily need to develop new theories to develop the new th phenomena but at some stage, uh, we may integrate uh, insights and then also develop new theory, although new theory should be around new questions, not about asking the same old questions, because then you will find the existing theories actually do have a lot of explanatory power. I know Keith has a slightly different view on that. And if you are interested in that, please join us at the panel discussion, because at the next AIB conference, Someone organized the panel and he put the, uh, myself and, and Keith on the panel to discuss exactly this question of, of theory and IP in the digital economy. Do we need new theory? And as I indicated, I'm sort of, it, uh, a lot of the things have to do with the really interesting work that I find interesting to read has to do with new phenomena and trying to explain them. And then you connect with theory. Okay, with that, thank you very much. We have another, uh, we actually two ha have two webinars coming up in April, uh, one organized by Dana uh, around the GIPS Decade Award, and I will host one uh, on uh, host country policies in the late April. Uh, please uh, check your uh, wherever you get your news from, i.e. AIB list, for example, where AIB is publicizing its event. With that, thank you for the audience, for your questions. Thank you for the presenters. Thank you, Keith, for excellent hosting. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.